All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Ian. Um, this is the information you probably already know about me. Um, and this talk is about using game design for our dogs are more awesome. Okay. Uh, and I would recommend, yeah, that you mute your microphones, but uh, sounds like some of you have some ambient noise out there. Um, yeah. I'm just going to actually mute everybody until we have uh, conversation topics. Okay. Um, Anyway, to, to let you know this, um, so th this is about game design and what we know about game design and what makes games fun and, and how to use that to make education more awesome. Um, so just to let you know, this talk's going to be a little different from most of the others in Alt DevCon. Uh, usually it's like 45 minutes of lecture and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. But I kind of want this session to be a bit more interactive, especially since there's only four of us here, or six of us total. Um, so. Um, I'll be talking, but feel free to break in with a question or comment or story or whenever you want. Uh, basically, if you have any kind of anecdote or comment to share, uh, you don't have to even type the whole thing in. Just type, like, I have an anecdote to share, uh, and we'll get the mic over to you. So this is a bit more freeform, like half lecture, half uh, GDC roundtable. Uh, so I'm, you know, I will be talking, but please do not let that stop you from, from kind of uh, uh, coming in. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and start talking at least. Um, so, so back in 2004, I encountered this little book. Uh, most of you have probably read it already. If not, I uh, highly recommend that you should. Uh, it'll only take you a couple hours. It's not that big. But the, the too long didn't read version is that learning and mastering a new skill is fun. Uh, it makes sense that evolution would select for people who enjoy building survival s skills. Uh, and games are particularly good at allowing players to learn and master new skills, and that's why they're fun. And that's that's Raf Kosh's theory. Um, so the corollary here is that you know learning and education is really the source of fun. Uh, game designers make the best teachers, and if your students and so your students should totally be ditching wows, dancing night elves in order to come and attend your class because you offer a much more engaging and immersive experience. And if you don't, then that means you're doing it wrong. Now, uh, granted, this argument is greatly oversimplified. It maybe has a few holes in it. If you look really closely, but it does mean that really we should set the bar a bit higher when it comes to making our classes fun, especially if we teach game design. Um, so, I mean, seriously, um, most of our colleagues teach in the same stage on the stage, stage on the stage lecture format that was used when classrooms were first optimized to turn out an educated workforce during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the rest of the world has changed slightly since the 1840s, um, so maybe it's time to re-examine our teaching methods. Now, of course, you know, pedagogy is a huge field, uh, way too much to cover in just 55 minutes. So I want to really drill down and concentrate on one little aspect of teaching. And the one place I really thought would be interesting to examine here is um, how we design our homework assignments and, te and exams and grading rubrics. And you might think, well, that's kind of a weird topic. Why? Um, and I think the reason is because on a scale of one to boring, homework assignments rate about 9.5 borons, uh, to coin a new SI unit. Um, so this is an area which has a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, it really doesn't take much to get better. I, I mean, if you think about it, even the names we use to describe these things have connotations that, that assume boredom. I mean, you know, homework. You know, what does homework mean? Work is the opposite of play. Uh, it's something you do because you have to, not because you want to. So this just reminds students that they're going to go home where all their games are and not play them. Um, you know, or the word assignment, which means like this is being assigned to you. You are being given a task. It is not your choice of whether to do this task. You are following orders. Uh, it's like the military, right? You didn't come to boot camp to have fun, soldier. You came here so I could kick your ass and give you an assignment. You know, th that's what it means to assign. This is not something that we enjoy. Um, or sometimes instead of uh, assignment, we use the word exercise. As in here, do these exercises. Um, now, sure, some people like exercise, but you know, to most people, it has this connotation like eating your vegetables. Like, you know, it's something you do because it's good for you, not because you want to. Uh, you know, it kind of brings your mind to mind like your high school gym coaches telling you no pain, no gain, right? So it's like deep down we know that homework is just not fun. 
and, and our words that we use to describe it you know, reflect that. Um, and then, of course, there's the word called grades, uh, which has this huge connotation that you're being judged, that your work is being held under a microscope by someone who knows more than you, uh, and that you're going to be humiliated if you make a mistake, or at least that there's going to be a bunch of red ink and you're going to feel stupid, and that your poor performance has real consequences. In other words, your homeworks are not just play. Uh, it is not a safe environment to experiment in. Uh, it is not a safe place to play around just for the joy of learning. Um, and, you know, the way we do assessments is the same way. I mean, none of these words that we use to describe our assessments um, sound like enjoyable things. They all sound kind of intimidating and ominous. Um, and then lastly, there's this word rubric, which, frankly, I, d I don't even know what this word means. I never even heard the word when I was an undergrad. Um, but I can imagine that telling students that uh, this is the criteria where you're going to be losing points and failing the class uh, is not exactly going to be inspiring. Um, so when I first became a teacher, this was kind of one of the first things I wanted to fix. And I want to talk about a couple of my attempts. And if you have other attempts that you have made in the past, uh, I'd really, really like to hear them. Uh, so, so please just kind of buzz on in. Um, so this was the cover page of my first syllabus. Um, this is clearly not the, um, you know, a, a standard syllabus cover page. Uh, and I did it on purpose that way because I wanted my students to know that this was not exactly their standard class, uh, that I was at least going to try to make things interesting. Um, so the first class that I taught, this was my grading system for the class. Uh, I figure since video games have point inflation, I figure, oh, why not try that here? Um, so, you know, if you have a maximum score in a game like Dance Dance Revolution that's between 1 million points for a beginning song or 10 million points for a really uh, hard song, and, you know, this is a 100 level you know, introductory class, so let's make the entire class out of a million points. Uh, and, you know, this one little change actually had a surprisingly big effect on how students thought of their grades. Because, you know, if you're used to a paper being graded on a percentile scale from 0 to 100, then getting 50,000 points feels like you've just made some really awesome progress. Um, even when it comes down to it, it's, you know, 50,000 on a homework is only 50%, which is really dismal. Um, but I think that can really be a healthier attitude towards grades, to look at a failed assignment as a good start and an opportunity to improve, rather than just this massive, you suck. Um, another class I tried later in the upper division, uh, I tried this up a game-like scoring system uh, that you might recognize. Um, and so, you know, basically at the start of the class, I gave everyone 100 hearts, and that was their life meter. Um, and, you know, whatever they had left at the end of the uh, of the class, that was their grade. Um, so, you know, so basically everyone had 100 hearts, and when they get points off in an assignment, their life meter would take damage. Um, extra credit, of course, this was healing you. Um, and what I found was this system actually had a neat little effect where by counting down instead of up, it lets students know exactly what the best possible grade that they could get in the class was at any given time. So, you know, if you're halfway through the class and you've already taken 30 damage, well, that's a good signal that maybe you should drop. Uh, I was actually afraid that this idea of taking damage and losing points off your final grade would be kind of demoralizing, uh, but it turned out, at least for the class where I used this, that the students didn't seem to mind so much. Uh, they thought it was kind of neat. And I, I know I'm not the only one who's done this. Uh, this guy's Lee Sheldon. He's pretty uh, well known in the educational space and, and in games. Um, and he's done something similar with his classes, but counting up instead of down using an XP system. So instead of doing homework assignments, he assigns quests. Uh, his players, which are his students, complete the quests in order to earn experience points. And then enough experience points lets the student level up their grade. Um, and I mean, you know, he's got enough success in this that he wrote a whole book on it. Uh, so this is obviously working really well for him. Um, and so I'm curious about uh, those of you who are here. Um, have you ever tried any kind of game-like grading system in your classes? I would love to hear your stories. Um, and like, you know, what did you do and how did the students react uh, if you've done anything like this? Please feel free to chime in either with the question panel or feel free to raise your hand and I can go ahead and give you microphone privileges. 
Now, Ian, I know I myself have not tried this in particular yet, but it's something I'm very interested in. I'm just curious if, um, I know schools have their own systems in place already for for grades for the most part and uh, certain scales. So is it something that you structure in, in a certain presentation to the students and then translate it into the traditional grades the school is looking for? Yes. Um, in my experience, most of the classes I've been in, uh, the grading system used by the school was just a letter grade, A, B, C, D, F, uh, sometimes with pluses or minuses. Um, and so, you know, percentiles translate into that naturally anyway. Um, so, yeah, I would just then translate whatever my grading system was into their percentile system or the grade system. Um, but I can still, you know, I can still frame it differently. Um, All right. Really uh, Jessica. Did you have something to add here? Or do you have microphone um, on you for that matter? I guess it's another important question. Uh, I see the question down here just says, I've been wanting to do something like that since I saw Extra Credits Gamification episode. Yep, I love it. Um, but I feel like I'm too busy to work out how to do it. Um, so if you want the, the easy way of doing it, buy Lee's book um, and, and just do whatever he says. Um, that's the easy way. Uh, but I'll, I'll actually talk about some case specific case studies a little bit later on uh, in this presentation too. So, um, so thanks for the comment. And yeah, I love extra credits too. Um, and so I actually wanted to talk about that. Um, so there is this one little thing that, that that kind of bothers me about all of this that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I mean, obviously it works, right? Um, you know, I, these new grading systems kind of, you know, make things feel more game-like, and it, it should work. Um, and the thing is, I don't think it should. Um, and the reason is actually because of exactly what Jessica said, is uh, gamification. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard this term before, uh, and be thankful if you haven't, um, you know, it, it means different things to different people. Uh, you know, but it kind of has this, this bad reputation in the industry, kind of the same reason that uh, edutainment is a term that people hate, um, basically just because of, not because it's bad on its own, but because of its poor implementation in a lot of places. Um, and generally the places that actually use the word gamification, uh, they use it to mean um, describing a description of adding systems like points and badges and other external reward systems in place in order to incentivize someone to do something that they wouldn't normally want to do, uh, like study. Um, you know, or plenty of other things too, like, for example, if you've wondered why every store you shop at these days seems to have their own rewards card that gives you points on every purchase, um, that's why. Um, now the thing is, as a game designer, prof you know, professional game designer myself, uh, the, the concept of gamification really rubs me the wrong way. I mean, to me, the fun of a game comes from interacting with interesting systems uh, and making interesting choices, and not just layering a point system on a work task and calling it done. Um, you know, at best, this is condescending to our students. Uh, it's like treating my college students like they're in kindergarten, where, um, you know, I expect them to go above and beyond to get a gold star or a sticker. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, they've been out of kindergarten for many years now. They should be able to be a little bit more mature than that. Um, and at worst, there's been a ton of research just saying that if you add an external motivator, like a point system or a cash reward, it displaces the internal motivation. And what do I mean by internal motivation? I mean the motivation to learn for the sheer joy of learning something new. Um, so if we give students points, the psychological research is very clear that we make them stop having fun learning, um, something we as educators want to keep a very close eye on. Uh, and anyway, we already have a point system in place in education, so the idea of coming up with another one seems kind of stupid. Um, the point system we have is called grades, so it's not even adding a point system to something else. Even if gamification worked, right? Um, it's you know, it, this isn't it. It's it's not adding a point system. It's replacing one point system with another. So realistically, this shouldn't work at all. Um, and my students should have just rolled their eyes at such a transparent attempt to get them to care about my assignments, but it didn't. You know, so. Why did it work? And honestly, uh, part of me is not 
sure it did. Um, I think if I just told some mediocre teacher who still thinks that skill and drill is a good idea, you know, hey, just make all your assignments out of a million points instead of a hundred, you know, I don't think, and, and if they didn't change anything else, I don't think it would change anything. I don't think it'd make any difference. Maybe it'd even make things worse because students would have to do extra math just to figure out where they stood in class. Um, so I come back to this question, why did it work for me? Um, and I think the answer is because it's not about the scoring system. It's about play. I, when I design a scoring system like this, I'm showing my playful side. I'm having fun with the scores. And I'm treating this like play. And because I'm treating the scores like play, it gets students to relax a bit. Because, hey, if the professor isn't taking grades too seriously, maybe I shouldn't either. You know, maybe I should just take the rest of the class seriously, not focus so much on grades, and focus instead on other things, like enjoying the learning process. And, you know, sure enough, I mean, when I use a system like this, I basically never have students come to me and whine for points just so they can have a higher grade. I, I do have students that uh, come to me and argue over the result of my grading when, I, when they think that I graded them unfairly. But they usually come to it from the perspective of wanting to understand why I did what I did so they can learn more, not just about trying to get extra points out of me so they can improve a grade. And it's almost like, you know, I'm going off and making some arbitrary artificial scoring system. And by doing that, I just expose the fact that grades are already artificial and arbitrary. Uh, and it's kind of that honesty that is really the hook for my students. And I would, you know, so, and I would just like to point out here that um, you know, when we think in terms of assessments and grades and exams and things, um, you know, that uh, the gameplay and the you know, kind of the content of our courses and the assessment of that content in our classes, that's, those are usually two separate things. You know, we have the instruction and then we have the assessment. Um, you know, so I have lectures and then I have exams or homeworks. Um, I just want to point out that uh, in most games, it doesn't work that, that way. Um, the gameplay and the assessment aren't two separate things in a game. They're the same thing. Uh, you, know, you don't play a level in a game in order to learn the game skills and then take a final written test to pass at the boss level, right? I mean, you, you learn as you play through the level, and you pass the test when you pass the level. You know, the instruction and the learning are all mixed together. And we have a name for this in our classes, too. It's called project-based work, where students learn by doing. And I do think we need to do a bit more of this. Uh, I mean, especially if your goal in your class is, if you're teaching a game design class where your goal is to teach students how to design a game, um, then shouldn't you really be making, having them make games uh, in order to assess them, rather than having, I mean, does it really make sense to have a written final exam uh, as opposed to having them design a game? Uh, it's especially true if you preach to your students about the importance of iteration when making games in your class, right? The idea that, oh, here's, um, you know, if you're going to make a great game, you need to be able to iterate on it. You need to be able to design, play test, evaluate, and make changes. Uh, and then, by the way, I'm going to slap down this two-hour written exam on your desk, and there's nothing that you can, uh, you know, and you have no opportunity to iterate at all. So that's no good. Um, you know, so, I mean, you know, so, so if you do that, I'm going to call you on it right now, even if your students don't. Um, but still, there's, uh, there's this other question, which is just, you know, is there something I can do beyond a scoring system? I mean, if you think about it, what is the flow of the typical class and, and our typical assignments um, if you were going to translate it into game terms? And basically, you get an assignment, you know, your students get an assignment, let's call it a quest, um, and then, you know, the player completes the quest as asked for, and they get a reward, you know, experience, gold points, you know, gold pieces, or just grades, whatever uh, you want to call them. Uh, and then they go and they get another uh, quest, and they just keep doing this in purely linear form. Um, you know, and, you know, this is totally linear, and it's totally what we would call an XP grind. Um, and, and what's worse, it's actually a little bit worse than that, because usually they have to wait uh, between uh, assignments. You know, I complete an assignment and I don't even get the next one for another couple of days. So it's like a Facebook game where you're given one quest at a time and then tells you, hey, congratulations on completing this quest. The next one's available in two days. Um, 
And you know, the kinds of hardcore gamers that mostly populate our game development classes really don't like this style of play. Um, so what are some alternatives? Um, so first of all, uh, games provide choices. Uh, sometimes games designers call this player choices, sometimes they call it player agency, sometimes they just say, well, let's give the illusion of player agency, that's close enough. Um, the point is that you, you want uh, you know, students to be making interesting choices in, in their uh, work. Um, like for example, a typical game, uh, an RPG, doesn't necessarily just, um, usually there are several quest chains that, open, that are open at once, uh, and the player all, uh, multiples at any one time, uh, and they can go back and forth between them. And some quests, individual quests, give choices, like you can kill five rats or pay five gold. Um, some quests only have a single objective, like get through this dungeon, uh, but there are several ways to get there, like there are multiple paths through the dungeon. Um, now, a traditional class doesn't usually have that many choices in it. Um, very often the only choice is, do you raise your hand in class to ask a question or not? And, and there's been actual published research in uh, education that shows that an, the average student asks a question once every 10 weeks. So that's three meaningful decisions in an entire academic year. And I mean, seriously, that's pitiful. I mean, I have more than three meaningful decisions just 15 minutes playing with Farmville. Um, so one thing we can do with assignments is give our students choices. You know, choose a topic to write about for the paper. Or, you know, if you're making a game, designing a game, make decisions in the design of that game so that it's not just designing a specific game. Uh, maybe even here's two alternate assignments and you can do one or the other, your choice. Um, or even here's a list of several assignments and you have to do them all, but you can choose the order that you do them in. Um, so you can hand, so you can hand in any assignment you want, but you have to assign in, turn in one per week. And when you give me that one, I will give you the next one in that sequence. So you can choose to either switch to learning a new topic or just go more in depth into your current one. Um, you know, but really the, um, you know, so there, those are some simple choices you can add right now. Um, but really if you look at game design, I mean the textbook way to make an interesting choice in a game is to make those choices meaningful. And meaning generally comes from having an interesting kind of trade-off. Uh, so maybe you give students cho choices that are trade-offs, like you can do one task that's easy but boring, or you can do a second task that's harder but more interesting. Um, or maybe you have a um, two ways of doing a task, and one of them is uh, it takes less time, but the other one is worth more points. Um, or maybe you have two methods of doing things, and one of the methods is going to allow the student to stay in their comfort zone, and the other helps them to build a new skill that will help make later assignments in the course easier, um, but it's a little bit harder now. Um, so, so there's lots of ways to play around with uh, in building interesting choices into the design of our assignments and rubrics. Um, another thing that we can learn from games uh, is that games also have difficulty levels. Because uh, they recognize that not every player is coming in with the same skills and experience. Um, you know, game designers know this. That's why we have difficulty levels in the first place. So it honestly blows my mind that we are that our administrations allow us to treat our classes as one size fits all. Um, you know that you're always teaching too fast for a third of your class and too slow for a third of, for another third of your class, at least. Um, so why do we accept this as a necessity? when games already have such an elegant way around it. You know, why can't we say, hey, um, here's a baseline level of skill that you need to barely pass this class. And basically, everyone in this class should be able to do it, even if you suck at whatever it is that I'm teaching. Uh, as long as you put in enough effort, uh, you will gain some very basic skill and you will pass. But if you're good at this or you enjoy it, here are plenty of opportunities to challenge yourself, take your skills up to the next level, and you'll get a better grade. You won't get a C minus. You know, you'll pass and you'll you'll do well. Um, and hey, if you're like some super talented superstar that's just going to be bored going through this class, here's some optional work to do that's totally fascinating. It'll really challenge you, and it'll give you the opportunity to do something that gets you noticed by the industry as a student. Like you know, you know, like here, let's work on a game that could win the IGF, you know, student showcase or something like that. Um, and everyone else can just safely ignore it, but the superstars will have the ability to really shine. Um, 
So, you know, there are ways to build difficulty levels into our classes in order to reach a broader range of student abilities. Um, here's another difference between games and classes. Games allow for collaboration, um, kind of built in. Even single player games will let a friend of yours be on the couch and, and kibitzing while you play, or you can trade off. Um, you know, and, you know, um, in academics, we have another name for this. We call it academic dishonesty. We call it cheating. We call it plagiarism. Um, so when students play games with each other, um, collaboration is, is fun and it makes things more enjoyable and it's awesome. And then they get to school and all of a sudden it's something that can get you kicked out of school and it's horrible. And then they get to the workplace and all of a sudden collaboration is expected again. Uh, so we are kind of, as academics, we're kind of in this really weird space where we're like the only place on the planet where collaboration sucks. Um, and I really think we should be rethinking the whole relationship of students to each other in the context of coursework. Um, now, I'm not saying, hey, let's let lazy students copy their work from good students and call it done. Um, and I'm not even saying you have to force students to work in teams either. But you can at least let them choose to work alone or in a group as long as they credit their sources properly. Um, I mean, really, if you, your students are working together, they're probably going to teach each other much more efficiently than you can teach them anyway. And just from a purely selfish standpoint, it's less work for you if your students teach themselves. Um, so another thing you might ask is, well, what about finals? Um, you know, final bosses, final exams, uh, collaboration is all fine and good for projects, it's good for homeworks. How can you collaborate in a final exam, right? Um, and I've actually run two different kinds of collaborative finals in the past that have both worked really well for me. Um, you might wonder how I'd be able to assess an individual if their work is all done in a team, but really it's easier than you might think. Um, the top performers tend to distinguish themselves. And, and again, for those of you joining us, um, I, I will keep talking because, and going on because you know I'm an academic and I can do that. But if you have any stories or anecdotes or comments or questions, please you know, um, you know, buzz in. Uh, you know, let us know. Um, I want this to be more collaborative than, than that. So um, one class I've taught uh, as an example, uh, this is a class about the game industry in general. So I expect students to know a lot of content, uh, not so much in terms of development skills. So they're learning things like what is the difference between a developer and a publisher? Uh, what are some really important people and games and events in the industry that they should know? Uh, basically, how can you talk the talk of a developer so that you can go to GDC and not embarrass yourself? Um, so in order to kind of quiz them on this, I put together this kind of collaborative live action game show. Um, and the rules were this. I, I would basically go around the room asking each student in turn a question, an essay style question. Uh, and they're going to answer that question as, best, as completely as they can. Uh, and then anyone else can raise their hand. I call this buzzing in um, to either agree with the original answer but elaborate on it or to disagree with it and give what they think is the actual correct answer. And any extra points that this buzz-in would generate if it had been part of the original answer, I split 50-50 between the original student and the one that buzzed in. Um, and so even if a student totally bombs their own question, it's not 100% deadly to them because they're going to get help from the rest of the class. And a good student, even if they totally blow their own question, they're going to be able to make up for that loss by helping other people in their questions. Um, and the people who keep buzzing in and consistently helping others and consistently coming up with good answers are generally the top performers in the class. It's really obvious uh, that they're the ones that know what they're doing, and the final scores do reflect that. Now, granted, this does only work in small classes, um, maybe 10 to 15 max, because uh, it is done in real time, and you are limited in the amount of time of a final exam. Uh, for me, usually, I only get two hours for a final exam period, and that time can run out very fast. Um, and I like to have enough time to at least ask each student two or three questions. Um, and another thing I do is I start off this show in my this exam in my game show voice. You know, I say, you know, "Welcome to our final exam. I am your host, Ian Schreiber, um, and let's go over the rules one more time for those playing along at home and in our studio audience." All right, are you ready? Contestant number one, here's your first question, and so on. Um, you know, and I, again, this, this just sets the tone as being playful. 
Um, and most students, within like five minutes, they've forgotten that they're taking an exam that's worth 20% of their final grade. They're just having too much fun watching me be a bad game show host. Um, so it's really a lot like the grading methods of a class. If I just show students that I'm not going to take this too seriously, then they start to relax. Uh, and when they relax, then that helps me get a more accurate assessment during the exam, because uh, I know that um, you know, because I know that you're, um, you know, that they're that if they get a question wrong, it's not because they were nervous; it's because they actually genuinely didn't know. Uh, I have a comment here from Alex. Uh, plagiarism is a bad example of student collaborations. It's one thing to do a project with someone, and another thing to copy from them and say it's your own work. That's totally true. Um, so yeah, it, you're probably right. That's an unnecessary exaggeration, and I don't mean to say that uh, you know plagiarism is bad, but uh, a lot of times collaboration itself is also uh, looked down upon. Uh, there's plenty of classes where uh, it says in the class policy and the syllabus you are expected to do your own work. Um, you know, and if you get help from someone else, you're just not allowed, um, and you're not allowed to work with other students in the team. Um, and I think that's a mistake because uh, I don't know of any. Uh, you know, certainly in the game industry, I don't know of any development studios where you're not allowed to work as part of a team. So anyway, um, back to this final exam. I did need to iterate on this design a lot. Um, you know, I found out that over time that I had to offer a standard written exam for students who were just too intimidated to speak in front of the class, even if it was more fun. Uh, I found that I needed to add limits to how many times a single person could buzz in and a penalty if they didn't add anything. A lot of students were uh, trying to buzz in with just a me too in order to get some free points or just take a random guess to try and get extra points um, for free. And uh, the problem was that if it, everyone keeps talking about a single question, then it can stall and I can't get on to the other questions. Um, I also found that if I had some extra time, I should come prepared with at the end just a little bit, uh, then I want to add a lightning round at the end for bonus points where I just ask very short questions, no buzz-ins allowed, um, you know, five seconds to answer, you know, just to change things up a little bit. Um, I also added some hidden answer questions where every, where it's not asked of an individual, it's asked of everyone in the class, and everyone just writes down uh, their answer on an index card and signs it, just Final Jeopardy style, uh, just because it gets me more uh, questions that each individual gets to answer. Um, and since I live demo games as part of my, uh, of this particular exam, I like to bring up games, uh, you know, play through a little bit of them and then ask questions about it. Um, and these games are on multiple platforms. I, I've done games on everything from the NES all the way up to, you know, modern day consoles. Um, you know, so I need, learned that I need to arrive like an hour early just to set everything up and test all the hardware so that I'm not burning 10 minutes of exam time just getting the projector to work. So another case study that uh, I've done, a, a different final, completely different kind of final exam. So, so this is one way where a final exam can be collaborative. Um, and I actually tell my students the best way to study for this kind of exam is actually to collaborate when studying. Uh, have everyone study every, you know, every topic a little bit and then uh, organize it so that each individual um, learns one other topic really in depth. So if it's like a 10-week course and there's 10 students in it, then have every student study one week where they just completely know that one week cold. Um, and, and if the students do that, then you know that you're going to at least get a reasonably okay grade for your own question, for any question that's asked of you, and you know that someone else has got your back 100% for everything that you missed. Um, you know, usually students didn't do that, but the idea that an exam would give people an incent a direct grade incentive to collaborate, I thought was kind of neat. Um, another case study I've done, and this was with a, a class in game design. Um, so this is one where it's like, you know, a, a written final exam didn't really make sense for me. I wanted them to be making games. Uh, and so I had them actually design a game during the final exam period, uh, in a short period of time, kind of like a game jam. Um, so student, I had students work in teams partly because they get better flow of ideas that way, and partly so that I have fewer things to grade, and I'm just selfish that way. Um, so I start them off with a constraint, uh, something like, say, um, you know, one of them was, uh, you'll, you'll make a game about a lake, a snake, and a cake, um, or whatever. You know, I, I would come up with all sorts of crazy things. Um, and then uh, just, and then just uh, you know, to really drive my students nuts, 
um, I would add uh, and be playful. I would modify the constraint every 15 minutes or so based on things that I'd really encountered in the industry. Like, oh, by the way, you know, add this uh, IP to the game. Um, you know, or oh, we're changing uh, changing platforms now. This is no longer a Wii game. Now it's an iOS game. Uh, change your you know change your user interface accordingly or whatever. Um, and then at 30 minutes to go, um, when when there's 30 minutes left in a two-hour exam, I would inform them that actually I'm cutting the time short. You really only have 15 minutes left. Uh, so just to see if you could hurry up and finish. And then 14 minutes after that, uh, I would let them know, oh, it was a false alarm. Actually, you can have the rest of the time back for polishing your product now that you can no longer use it. And it's the equivalent of this has happened to me in the industry. And yes, I have had students come to me after they got into the industry saying, yeah, that happened to me too. I thought you were just being mean, but really you were trying to teach us something during the final, um, which is exactly right. Um, and when they're busy working together on this final, I'm walking around the room and, and observing. Um, and if I see someone who isn't contributing to their game, uh, to their team, I will be keeping an eye out and occasionally I'll suggest something to the room like, hey, maybe that one person who's really way too quiet uh, is sitting on a bunch of ideas and you should ask them what they think. Uh, but usually I see everyone involved and it really ends up being a solid group effort. Um, you know, and it's pretty easy to see just by watching students because they don't when, when they're busy making a game amongst themselves, they don't even notice if you're like looking over their shoulder. You really have to like, you know, go and cough really loudly in order to get their attention if you want to say something and break in. Um, so this is, uh, you know, so, so it makes it really easy for me to kind of be this invisible fly on the wall that just goes around and observes how students are making games. And that's part of the assessment. Um, you know, and throwing the addition unexpected challenges in real time also just serve the purpose of making this a very playful thing. Um, you know, students are too engaged to remember that this is a high pressure exam. They're just having too much fun. Um, so again, you know, if any of you have any other uh, final exams or assignments or anything like that that you've done, uh, I would love to hear about it. Um, um, so. Feel free to either raise your hand and I can give you microphone privileges or go ahead and type a question into the question panel. I actually have uh, a question too as well, Ian. Um, back on the uh, whole agency and offering them choices sorts of uh, topic, do you, do you feel it's important to, to offer them a narrowed down selection of choices? Because I've, I found that like uh, if I was like telling my students, uh, you, can, you can choose any, any genre you want for your project, they, they tend to freeze up like if you offer them too much choice. That, that is definitely true. You're right. And that is a good thing to bring up. I'm glad you asked that. Um, yeah. Yes, if you make things too wide open, you get a deer in headlights where students just don't know where to even begin. And this is why when I assign like a game design challenge of some kind, I always, always, always start with constraints. Um, it's partly to get them moving on it uh, and, and not have them freeze up. And also partly because in the real world, you know, you never have just a, you never have something that doesn't have constraints. I mean, there's always something in terms of you know, genre, budgets, uh, any number of things. So, so definitely something to get them started. You know, but, but my examples were even just for adding like a very simple A-B choice. You, know, you, you can either do this or that. Um, and even something as simple as that can make it more interesting, I think, to, to students. Uh, but you're right, that if you leave things way too wide open, it can sometimes be hard to start. And usually it's good to add at least a little bit of uh, something to get them started thinking about how, how am I going to do this rather than, you know, I don't know where to start. Um, so that's a good point. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? Please feel free to chime in. Either uh, raise your hand or question panel. Ah, Bill Crosby. Hi, Bill. Hi, Heather. Hi, Ann. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. OK, good. I wasn't sure if I had my mic on. Um, so I'm just wondering about the way you kind of evaluate after after the fact. So you're, you're recording as you're going through. It, it sounds like a very intensive experience for you, Ian. Um, 
are there certain uh, guidelines, tips, techniques that you could suggest that would help us really um, spot in this, this, like, I guess I'm trying to figure out the size, how many teams you're going through in this two-hour period as you're jumping from team to team and how much time you're spending with each team and how you, how you manage that. Uh, because that would be, that's been sort of, I find myself getting bogged down with teams, with a particular team, and I was wondering if you had suggestions. Okay, great question. Um, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, the, I, with, with all, all of my exams where I do something that's not just slapping a paper down on a desk and saying turn it over and begin, um, one thing I found that helps is uh, coming to class really prepared. Uh, it does take more time to prepare. Uh, for these things, I need you know I like to have a script so that I know exactly what I'm doing at any point. Um, you know I you know if there's specific uh, time points in the class, I'll actually like set an alarm that goes in and beeps off for me so that I I remember to like stay on track. Uh, things like that. Uh, my classes usually aren't super huge. Uh, obviously, if you're teaching a 200 person class, this sort of thing isn't going to work that well. Um, I admit it doesn't scale up that well. You have to try alternate things for that. Um, you know, for a game design class, my classes are usually like 20 people or less. So if I'm dividing it into teams of four, you're talking about five teams, uh, and you're talking about a two-hour experience. So I agree with you. It, it definitely is intense. Uh, you definitely want to have your morning coffee before starting something like this, uh, especially like if I'm playing game show host, I am trying to keep the energy in the room up for two hours, and it, it will be exhausting, uh, but it's a lot of fun uh, also. Uh, any of you who have ever GM'd for a, for a tabletop campaign know kind of what that feeling is like, um, you know, to you know, have your party get this really intense uh, experience because that you've kind of guided them through. Um, so, so it's definitely a lot of fun and a lot of uh, enjoyable to experiment with, but it de definitely does uh, a lot of energy. Um, you know, so for something like uh, and two hours. That's actually a lot of time to observe. Um, so I will just basically be going around switching teams about every five minutes or so, just observing what they're doing, listening to what they're saying, uh, and just taking notes on a clipboard. Uh, that's pretty much it. And you know, on and so it's like on my clipboard, I already have uh, kind of forms and things that I've put together for myself ahead of time. That there's specific thing if there's specific things I want to look for. Uh, in terms of like individuals who are uh, contributing or not. Um, so maybe I'll have like an area on the sheet of paper for every single team and every single person in the class. Um, I'll know who's on what team when I go in uh, so that everything's laid out and I just have to like find the person and check them off. Um, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, the game show one actually takes a bit more preparation because I have like uh, I have to come up with uh, you know, a list of all my questions, all of the right answers that I'm looking for, and additional answer and additional space. So I, I kind of have this form where I've got, you know, here's the question, here's the rubric for you know how many points these various types of answers are worth. This is what I'm looking for, uh, and then a space down below for like you know here's other things that they said that I didn't expect but I want to give credit for. Um, you know, and then you know, here's the number of the contestant who answered. Here's the uh, answer and the extra points, um, and so on. So it's a whole system uh, that you know, if you sit down and design this, uh, you know, you'll come up with uh, you know ways to uh, do this ahead of time. So, um, other questions? I see a couple of things here. Thank um, you, Bill and Ian. From Matthew, the saying the. Uh, the opposite of being wide with constraints, how do you know your constraints are too narrow? Um, that's a very good question. Um, experience. <laughs> uh, you, you try it and you get a feel. Um, usually what I find is when, it, when I'm giving a game design uh, challenge that the um, it's very hard to make things too narrow. Students will diverge anyway. Um, even if I give very, very specific instructions. Um, you know, so that's usually less of an issue. Um, and, and usually I find, though, that it's, it, it doesn't take very much to, um, to, get someone, you know, to get someone started. So a very wide constraint or a very narrow constraint, as long as there's at least some there, you actually have a very wide range uh, that students can operate in uh, effectively. 
So, and I, I think you know you should try it even just with like smaller minor assignments. You know, try giving like a really wide, you know, a, a really wide example and, and then a really narrow one, and just see how much the student ideas diverge. Um, Alex asks, do you apply this kind of evaluation of technique on other course types, like not game design? And if so, did I have the same results? Uh, I haven't really done that because mostly I do teach in the area of game design. Um, so I want to be seeing the students designing games, and I want to see uh, you know, both the uh, ability of them to, to build decent games or game ideas or game design documentation, or I want to see them uh, you know, demonstrating that they know how to do the process. Um, so, for example, if I've been talking all cement, all you know, term about the importance of iteration and playtesting, you know, during a two-hour final exam, I'm I'm looking for students who actually put that into practice and who are, you know, taking some index cards and some dice and starting to playtest in like five minutes and and not waiting to you know an hour thirty minutes in to to first start playing it. Um, so things like that that I'm looking for, um, you know, with other course types that might not apply. Um, you know, it all depends on kind of what your course goals and learning outcomes are and what is it that you expect your students to get out of the class and then saying, okay, how do I assess that? Um, so, uh, so if you have more questions, definitely raise your hand, type your question into the question box. Um, I'm just going to kind of wrap up since it looks like I'm running out of time here. Um, Yep, it's getting a little bit down to the wire, but we're also the last session, so if you do have any further comments, we can definitely handle those. Okay, um, so just uh, basically, here, here's some takeaways that I'd like you to take back to your classes from this, uh, just from my experience. Uh, one is cultivate a strong sense of play in yourself, um, and let that playfulness show in all aspects of how you approach your teaching. Um, students really pick up and respond to it if you are treating your class like a game and you want it to be playful. Um, I think they really tend to respond to that, at least in my experience. Um, another thing, you know, put iteration into practice. Try something new and experimental with your class every time you teach it. Iterate on the gameplay. You know, if you were a game designer, you would be iterating on your gameplay after every playtest. You know, and so, and also like games. You learn very quickly in game design, don't iterate on everything at once. Change one thing at a time, and then evaluate if it's better or worse. If you change ten things all at once, uh, you have no way of knowing which of those things were net positives or net negatives. Um, you know, but do iterate. Try new things. Um, and also be upfront with your students when you are trying something new. Uh, they tend to be a lot more forgiving if you fall flat on your face, which you're going to do if you keep experimenting uh, from time to time. Um, and just be, remember to be forgiving to them as well in return. For example, if you give them a new kind of assignment and it ends up being a lot harder than you originally thought it was going to be, you know, don't take points off of them just because you screwed up. Um, you know. And lastly, just you know, try and shift your thinking from uh, using your assessments and assignments as drilling students or examining them. Um, think of it in terms of showing them how much they've grown and how much more awesome they are now that they've taken your class. Um, if you think about like a really good video game with a really good final boss fight, you come out of that feeling like you are awesome and you just saved the world. You feel really good about yourself because you did something really cool. And you know this is a joy. Learning something new, mastering a new skill is a wonderful joy in the world. And you know, give students the opportunity to experience that joy. Um, so think of your assessments and assignments as a way of showing your students how awesome they are. Um, you know, give them an opportunity to really show off, not just to you and not just to your classmate, their classmates, but to themselves. Um, you know, don't take that joy of, of mastery away from them. And you know, please. Let's stop approaching our assignment assessments as tasks and chores that aren't fun. I mean, you know, the first book that I wrote with Brenda was called Challenges for Game Designers. And the word challenges there was deliberate. Throughout the entire book, we never use the word homework or exercise. It's always the word challenge. You know, that's on purpose. And you could also call these other things that are fun too, quests, or even home play instead of homework, or any number of other things. Um, 
Now, just as a caveat, I mean, that does not mean that you can just change the vocabulary and nothing else. I mean, that's a cheap trick, and your students will call you on it. But if you make your assignments actually engaging and interesting and fun to do, then calling it home play is appropriate, and it will be noticed. Um, so with the 30 seconds that we have left, or any other time, if we can extend this, um, you know, please, let's have additional questions, comments. I'd like to know what you're doing in your classes, if anything, um, you know, because I want to learn from you as much as anything else. I, I have an additional uh, question, of course. Um, how do you, I mean, obviously you, you want to try to balance um, the playfulness to an extent, of course. Um, how how do you approach balancing it? I mean, it, if you if you push it too far, then then they it could get unproductive. Of course, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, you can still be getting things done while playing. So, I, I think play does not automatically mean that you're wasting time. Um, you know, think of for example a play test of a of a game prototype. That's real work. It's fun. It's interesting. Um, you know, but it's still work, and you still have to be productive. I and mean, students do still have to be productive. And they, no matter how playful you are, they are still going. There is still going to be that one nagging thing in the back of their head that crap. I have to get a grade out of this, and that grade is going on my permanent record. And may affect my employment opportunities, and so on and so forth. But there's no way to really get rid of that entirely. So I, I tend to. You know, so I tend to go towards the extreme of err on the side of playfulness uh, because I know that the rest of the educational system errs on the side of squashing all enjoyment out of the fun of learning. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to overbalance, really. Ah, good points. Does anyone else have anything to add? Ah, Matthew again. Uh, what if external sources such as parents are dead set on traditional evaluation systems and are going for the A plus and so forth? Um, the A plus is pressured on the students. How, if possible, do you promote this change in the parents' mindsets? Wow, that is a wonderful question. I've actually never experienced it, believe it or not. Um, when I w first became a teacher, this was over five, like five and a half years ago. Um, I was warned that, you know, there were these things called helicopter parents who just, like, hover over their children and, you know, will, and if the student has any, you know, anything going, you know, the slightest bit different in their classes, the parent will come and pay me a visit in office hours. Um, and I've, like, never actually experienced that. Um, so I, I know it does happen. Um, Usually, if parents are going to complain about anything, they're going to be complaining to the administration that their child is taking a class with the word game in its name, and, you know, what kind of education program are you guys running here that they're, you know, what's next, underwater basket weaving, um, <laughs> and whatever. But uh, um, I, I think, you know, to, to an extent, I would say, um, you know, if, if a parent did approach me and said, hey, um, you know, my, my student, you know, needs to get these grades because they need to have a high GPA so they can be marketable to the game industry. Uh, I would say, no, they don't. Uh, the game industry really doesn't care about grades. What the game industry cares about is um, can you help them make an awesome game? And if you can help them make an awesome game, then they really don't care if you have a degree at all. Um, you know, your child is here in my class because I'm here to teach them how to make awesome games. And if I can do that, then their final grade really doesn't matter as far as the industry goes. It may matter in some other industries. Um, those other industries probably don't care about what grade they got in a game design class. So that's how I would approach that. Uh, and that's just thanks to the fact that our industry really is, is like that. It really has kind of um, borderline contempt for higher education to begin with. This is one way that it uh, works in our favor. <laughs>